Please welcome to the stage NAIS President John Shubb. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, you know, and the, the truth is, um, after seeing something like that, I really don't have to say anything. You know, that, that is what we're all about. Um, it really is all about the kids. Um, one, thing that you, uh, one thing that you don't know about that performance, the middle number that you just saw was written by the, uh, by the young woman, the girl, who was the soloist. Is that amazing? So thank you to the school and the teachers and to the kids and everybody who made that, uh, made that possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor for me to stand before you uh, this morning as the, uh, as the new president uh, of NAIS. Uh, last year in Philadelphia, much worse weather, I had a chance to be introduced to you and I told you at that time how honored uh, I was to have this opportunity. And I'll, I'll tell you, a year later, uh, I feel that uh, even more strongly. Uh, over the past year, I've spent most of my time uh, on the road. You can ask my wife who's here. Uh, she can tell you all about that. Uh, and in the course of that, uh, in the course of all of my travels, I've been to 62 schools as of today. Uh, I've spoken to over 50 groups of, uh, of educators, teachers, heads, trustees, families, communities, to get a sense, uh, to get a sense of what's going on uh, in, our, in our school community. Uh, I've seen the care and the creativity uh, and, the, and the really high standards that we all bring to our work. Uh, and so a year later, uh, I just, I, I feel so grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to do this work and to be here with you this morning. Um, now last year, if you were here, uh, you may recall uh, that the staff gave me four minutes to speak to you. Uh, and uh, and after, after uh, the session was over, many of you came up to me and said how much you enjoyed my remarks. Um, so this morning they gave me 20, and there's a little clock that's running right here, so I know. Um, and I don't have the advantage of brevity <laughs> to, uh, to be successful. Uh, to keep it interesting, I just want to give you a, a little insight into how, uh, into how I speak. Uh, I don't use PowerPoint, so you may be grateful for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I also don't speak from a script. Um, and you may think that I'm just trying to be funny, but I am not. The best advice I got in public speaking, and I follow it, I got from a movie 20 years ago. Uh, as a road warrior, somebody who travels a lot, one of my favorite movies is Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Steve Martin, John Candy, trying to get home, delayed airport flights, you probably all know what that's, what that's like. Can't get home. John Candy is an incessant talker, the yammering, accidental, uh, accidental traveling companion for Steve Martin. And at one point, Steve Martin, in a moment of utter frustration, listening to John Candy, says to him, let me give you some advice. When you're telling a story, have a point it makes it so much more interesting for the listener, right? So that's kind of how I try to approach public speaking. I have a point, I have a basic story that I want to tell, and that's how I work. I actually only know for sure what I'm going to say for about the first three minutes. And those three minutes are now up. One other thing about my approach to public speaking, uh, and I actually only, only learned this uh, last week, um, and I think you'll find this interesting. At NAIS, we are, uh, we're in the process of updating some of our leadership development institutes, the things that we do in the, in the summer for new heads and aspiring heads and so forth. So um, one of the things that we're introducing this year is a new inventory for, for leaders and prospective leaders to take. It's kind of a personality test to understand sort of, you know, what your strengths are as a leader, what your challenges are as a leader. So I took the inventory and I learned some things about my own leadership style, my strengths and weaknesses. And 
One of the strengths that I learned I have is that I, I'm uh, apparently a straightforward communicator. So that's a good thing. One of my weaknesses is that I am prone to saying things that are untactful. <laughs> so um, at the risk of being untactful right off the bat, um, I'm going to say something that may rankle some of you, um, but here goes. Uh, I am not a big fan of the term sustainability. And I know that sustainability is all, all, of, all over our community. And just to be really clear, when we're using sustainability in its original sense, applied to the natural environment and the preservation of natural resources that are depletable, I'm all in. I'm an environmentalist. And as I travel the country, I see lots of great environmentally sustainable practices in our school schools. It's a, uh, it should be a point of pride for all of us. But what I don't like is I don't like the term financial sustainability. I don't like, I don't like the implication of financial sustainability and what it means for our future as a community of schools. It suggests that all we're interested in is maintaining. And I know every one of you in this room knows that we can do much better than that. I don't want us to be a sustaining presence on the education landscape. I want to see us be a growing and ever more important presence on the education landscape, and I think that that is our potential. This nation, just to get right to the bottom line, this nation needs more high-quality schools. We just do. And where are they going to come from? The public school system? I hope so. The burgeoning charter school world? I hope so. But what about independent schools? You know, my view, pure and simple, is that independent schools have the greatest potential to be the leading schools in this nation's future. And that is my point. Now, I want to illustrate this point a little bit. Right before the general session, there was something called the President's Breakfast, which is kind of a meeting of uh, members of NAS. And at that breakfast, I unveiled a framework that NAS has developed to help guide the work that we do for all of you week in, month in, year to year. And over the coming weeks, you'll, you'll be hearing communications from me through the blog, through our website. You'll learn more about it even here over the next couple of days, how we're thinking about serving. So this morning, in keeping with my, in keeping with my approach to public speaking, I want to unveil just one element of that framework and unfortunately, I'm going to do it with a PowerPoint slide. I'm sorry. So here goes. There you go. It's a vision statement. What do we think the potential is for the independent school community? A vibrant community of independent schools for a changing nation and a demanding world. The key word here is vibrant. Vibrant doesn't mean sustaining. Vibrant means growing, thriving, innovating. This is what we see as the potential. And I believe everybody in this room believes that that is the potential as well. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna about these things. I'm a very data-driven guy. But I believe the data and the facts support us, even though it's a large challenge. Over the last decade, private and independent schools have not been thriving. For two centuries, almost two centuries, private schools have played a very large and actually sustaining role in American education. But over the last decade, private and independent schools have, played, have come to play a decreasing role in serving America's kids. Private schools used to serve 11% of all kids, then 10%, and today it's 9%. And so the trends are not exactly with us. But I believe that that does not have to be the case. 
And it's because of the other part of this vision statement, the changing world and the demanding, the changing nation and the demanding world. I think that both of these challenges are for us great opportunity. And let me just say a little bit about that. The nation is changing in lots of ways, in lots of ways, but most fundamentally, the makeup of this great nation is vastly different than it ever has been. In five years, the majority of children in our nation's kindergartens will be children of color. We will be a so-called majority, minority nation, and the term minority doesn't apply anymore. Who is going to serve all, all children best? The sad fact is that America's schools have never been very good at serving all kids. It's a tragedy. And I do not believe that the relentless focus on test scores as a be-all and end-all of what our schools are all about, our public schools are all about, is going to get us there. Successful education is about educating the whole child. You reach a child emotionally, and then you educate them academically. And as I look at our schools, that's what I see as strength. In my tour of schools, I've seen this so many times. In the fall, I was at the Perky Omen School, which is a boarding and day school in eastern Pennsylvania. It's been around for 150 years, and I was given a tour of the school by the senior class president. His name's Armando. Armando is from Central America. Armando is not affluent. Armando is at the Perky Omen School on a full scholarship. He grew up, so, uh, grew up outside of Newark, was identified by a foundation that supports disadvantaged children attending independent schools. In his four years there, he'd been elected president of the senior class by his successes academically and on the sport fields. He gave me a wonderful tour of the school, and at the end of the tour, at the end of the tour, I said to him, what do you like best about your school? And he said, the community. And I thought, did your head tell you to say that? You know, who said, what, what, what young person says community? And I said, so what do you mean by that? And he said, um, he said, at this school, I feel like I have four mothers. I have my mother at home, and I have three teachers here who care so much about me that I feel like they're my mothers. That was a school that reached the whole child, a disadvantaged Hispanic child given this opportunity. Around the same time, I toured a school in Bethesda, Maryland, a school for girls. And I was given a tour by a ninth grader who had come to the school as an eighth grader, which is not a normal transition time. And she was so enthusiastic about her school. And so at the end of the tour, I asked her, what do you like best about your school? And she said, and it literally, broke my heart as I listened to her. She said, at my last school, I felt invisible. At our schools, kids don't fall between the cracks. We pay close attention. We surround our kids in values. And it helps all of our kids succeed. Not long ago, I was at a school in Baltimore, the Roland Park School. By the way, the school, with the, uh, the school that I mentioned prior, or was referring to previously is the Holton Arms School in Bethesda, Maryland. So I was at the Roland Park School in, uh, in Baltimore. And this is a very successful girls' school in all respects, teaching leadership, teaching engineering and science, mathematics, very, very impressive. Their school sits right next to a very disadvantaged neighborhood. And Roland Park wants to serve more of the kids in the disadvantaged neighborhood to do well for those kids, but also for the traditional Roland Park population to better understand the world of today and tomorrow. So what is Roland Park doing? They're opening their own charter school so that they can serve more kids and their own teachers and kids can benefit 
from interaction with the larger school community. Our world is changing. It's changing tremendously. It's the great thing about this nation. We are a melting pot. Our schools need to serve this melting pot well, and we are better positioned than anybody to do this. Now, the whole world is also changing and becoming demanding in all kinds of ways. Technology has swept the world, and it has stimulated economic growth, educational growth all over the planet. India growing like crazy, China growing like crazy. The list goes on and on. We have to prepare our kids for that world. Our public schools need to do that. Our charter schools need to do that. We need to do that. So as I tour our schools, I see wonderful examples of this. In December, I don't know what I was thinking, I was in Buffalo. <laughs> and yes, it was, it was snowing like crazy. So I visited a number of schools there, all very interesting in their, in their own rights. The Buffalo Seminary School, a long-standing school for girls in uh, downtown Buffalo, 20 years ago was nearly out of business. They had fallen down on an enrollment of about 65 kids. Today it's a thriving school of 250. I was given a tour by two high school girls, a local girl from Buffalo and a girl from China. And as I toured the school and saw all the great things that they were doing for young women, with especially an emphasis on science and mathematics and engineering once again, I saw the bond between these two kids, one from this country, one from far away. And as I saw the halls and the classrooms, I saw kids from all, literally all over the world. I think there's 12 different countries represented there, working together, learning together, using technology, working with their teachers in an ultra-modern environment. And all, was I, all I could think as I talked to these two young women about their aspirations was, how better could somebody be prepared for the future than to be in a school with this environment? It's just so rich and so much a part of the real world. You don't see that very often outside of our schools. This is a huge opportunity. So the changes and the demands, these are challenges, but they are at the bottom line opportunities. The final thing I'll say about our opportunity is this. We have something that nobody else has as we confront the future. It's an unbelievable asset, and that is our independence, right? Nobody tells us what to do. Our fate is in our own hands, and that is the best position to be in. Last month, the Microsoft Corporation introduced their new CEO, Satya Nadella, an engineer who'd been in the company for well over 20 years. And he wrote an email on his selection to everybody that he worked with. And he said in the email, you know, how honored he was by this opportunity to be the new CEO of Microsoft. And he said, you know, I recognize we've been one of the most important corporations on the planet during our time together. And I know that that has happened as we've been able to work together closely as a team, as a family. And I look forward to working together with all of you at Microsoft as a team and as a family. But I have to tell you something else. He said, our industry does not reward tradition. It rewards innovation. And so we have to stay together true to our traditions and our values, but we have to innovate. That's how we'll succeed. And I believe that that is absolutely the case with us today. We have unbelievably strong traditions. Our values, our focus on the whole child. Our support for children to become not only smart, but good. Our academic excellence. And we will be true to those traditions. Those are a great foundation. But at the same time, we need to innovate. We need to help our schools. We need to think as a community about what the classrooms of the future look like. We need to be, we need to be the schools 
that attract the very strongest teachers in the nation to come work with us. We need to be the schools that are able to think about a future for our kids that we can barely imagine. It's a huge challenge. We must innovate. But with the foundation that we've laid, we are better prepared than anybody to do that. So as I welcome you here to the conference and to Orlando, I hope you will join with my NAS colleagues in thinking about and embracing a vision of hope and optimism for all of our kids and all of our schools, and that you will enjoy sampling the creative thinking from our schools and our speakers as we imagine and embrace the great opportunities that are before us. So once again, thank you for this opportunity to serve, and I look forward to seeing each of you, talking with you, and having a great conference with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now before I leave the stage and move on to the main event, uh, I, wanna, I wanna say a few other thank yous. Uh, first, there they are. I knew they were in here somewhere. These are our graphic uh, recorders and they're gonna be here at uh, and throughout the conference at various sessions. <laughs> memorializing in pictures what our uh, speakers and presenters have to say. This is, this is their fourth year with us. They do a remarkable job. The artwork will be posted uh, around the conference site and will also be on our website so you can remember uh, what you've experienced here. Next, this conference obviously has a lot of hands involved in it. And uh, beyond the NAS staff, which does an unbelievable job, we have a, a local think tank, uh, folks from our, from our uh, schools in the Orlando area who come together, Florida more, more broadly, who come together to work with us to plan this program. And I would ask, I will ask them to stand. I can't see a thing up here. Um, but if you could please, there you go, some lights. Please stand for a round of applause and appreciation. In addition, um, as uh, uh, any of you who are here locally know, uh, NAS is only one of the organizations that tries to support you. Uh, here in the South, we have the Southern Association of Independent Schools and the Florida Council of Independent Schools. They also have been very helpful in making this uh, conference possible. So a round of applause for them, please. And then I'd like to also recognize explicitly the sponsors. Uh, whose resources and uh, financial support really do make uh, a conference of, uh, of this quality possible. And so one of our diamond sponsors who provided the, uh, uh, the event last night uh, at Epcot, uh, the Disney Youth Programs, a round of applause for them, please. I hope all of you have downloaded the, um, the mobile app and aren't wasting uh, paper with our program. Uh, Whipple Hill, a round of applause for their support for that. <laughs> Platinum sponsor ERB, they are the to be thanked for the general session that we're providing you right now and our speaker uh, about to come. Thank you, ERB. <laughs> and then finally, thank you to our gold uh, sponsors and our bronze sponsors the Klingenstein Center, uh, Lenovo, and the National Seed Project, and our bronze sponsors that you can see here. So a round of applause, please, for all of our sponsors. And then finally, I want to say, uh, when, this, uh, when the general session ends, uh, and you've had a chance to listen to our uh, wonderful first speaker, the exhibit hall will then be open, uh, and uh, our exhibitors offer a, a lot of practical ideas uh, for uh, our schools for the future. I hope that you will uh, take a close look at what they have to offer, and I also hope 
that you will take a look at NIS's resources, our membership, uh, our membership support center, our bookstore, lots of great things uh, for you to, uh, to take a look at and I hope uh, enjoy. And with that, I believe, let me just check. And with that, I will get off the stage. Thank you again and have a great conference.